Our scripture reading for today is from the Gospel of Mark. After Jesus came down from the mountain where he was transfigured in the glory of God, he continued to heal the sick and to cast out demons. People came to Jesus from all over with their needs and with their questions. When people started bringing little children to Jesus, the disciples tried to stop them. They didn't expect Jesus to want to give his time and attention to little kids. But Jesus surprised them again and said, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Jesus told his disciples to receive the kingdom of God as a little child. And Jesus took the children in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. Evidently, world, worldly power and prestige have no value in God's kingdom. God's kingdom is best received as an unearned gift to a little helpless child. This story leads us right into our reading for today about a rich man with a sincere question for Jesus it's a question that many of us have. What must I do to inherit eternal life? The rich man and Jesus shared a conversation, and then Jesus turned to his disciples to say more. Our readers can come forward. We'll hear the voices of the narrator, of Jesus, the rich man, and the disciples. Listen to these holy words from the 10th chapter of the gospel according to St. Mark. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away, grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words, but Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals? It is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now, in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and fields with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This is our first week in our journey with Everyday Spirituality, a book by James Hazelwood. Many of the things we do every single day are spiritual activities, whether we realize it or not. We don't only connect to God in worship or in devotion time. We live as spiritual people all week long as we breathe and taste and work and sleep and spend. Spend is the activity and the chapter in everyday spirituality that connects with the story of the rich man and Jesus. Money is part of our everyday lives. 
And James Hazelwood says that money is our ultimate everyday spirituality. He writes, when you live in this society, you are spending money all the time. It's automatic. Eating meals requires money. Heating a home requires money. Transportation and travel requires money. Phone and internet, health care and prescriptions, daycare, it all requires money. Whether it's cash or check or card or online, most of us have a financial transaction every day. How we use our money, how we regard our money, is closely connected to our relationship with God. Now, let's be careful. God is not just concerned with the portion of our money that we give to charity or to church. We're not talking only about a tithe, 10%, or our charitable giving. God is interested in what we do with 100% of our money, with how we spend, save, and give. These are the three main things we do with our money. And we can see all three in the conversation between Jesus and the man. And we'll look at one at a time. One thing we know for sure about the man is that he was a spender because he had many possessions. I wonder what all he owned for a first century man. Livestock, houses, boats. Maybe he owned a lot of jewelry or pottery or tools or camels. Maybe he had a lot of parchment paper and writings. That was very expensive in that day. According to USA Today, these are some of the most popular products people couldn't stop buying in 2019. Disney Plus. Instant pots, robot vacuums, essential oil diffusers, mattresses in a box, meal kit delivery services, wireless headphones, egg cookers, DNA test kits, non-stick frying pans, fire TV stick, meat thermometers. Now, I'm not going to ask you if you bought any of those things, because I know you did. <laughs> and none of it's bad. It's just stuff, conveniences, comforts mostly. Let's see real quick how savvy you are at pricing, just for fun. I used to watch The Price is Right. Anybody else here like The Price is Right? Here's your chance, right? St. John's version of The Price is Right. Which one of these two things costs more? The Instant Pot Duo 7-in-1 Electric Pressure Cooker or the Eufy Boost IQ RoboVac? Which do you think? Oh, you are right. It is the vacuum. The Instant Pot is only $79 on sale right now on Amazon. The RoboVac is $159.99. Okay, which of these two things costs more? An Ancestry DNA test kit or Apple AirPods with charging case? Now, this one surprised me. It is the Apple AirPods at $139. The, the test kit's only $99. Okay, last one. Which is more expensive? The Dash Rapid Egg Cooker or the Zillion Shiatsu Back and Neck Massager. It is the massager. $49.95. The egg cooker is only $19.99. The number one recreational activity described by most Americans is shopping. Too often we look to shopping and spending to find happiness. No, I'm not going to tell you how to spend your money. We're not going to get very far if I do that. And it is okay and necessary to spend money, even on comforts and delights to an extent. I'm just going to pose some spiritual questions, some God questions related to spending. Are you satisfied with how you're spending your money? Are you intentional with how you spend your money? Are you supporting businesses and enterprises that you want to? Are you promoting fair labor practices with your spending? Do your current spending habits honor God? Spending is spiritual. Another thing we know about the man who spoke to Jesus is that he was a saver. 
He was likely a young man who inherited great wealth and a local position of power. In the other Gospels, he is called a rich young ruler. So he probably had some discipline of saving in order to keep and accumulate his wealth. Most Americans today struggle to save. According to Go Banking Rates, 69% of Americans have less than $1,000 in liquid assets in a savings account, which is up, sadly, from 58% last year. And about half of Americans have no retirement savings at all. That's not so good. Are we spending too much? Are we making too little? Your first goal for savings would be a $1,000 emergency fund. Save it and don't touch it unless it's an emergency. Your next goal would be to save three to six months of expenses. Save it and don't touch it unless it's an emergency. And then start saving for the future and save at the beginning of the month. It takes some godly values to save, such as discipline, wisdom, self-control. One general rule of thumb is to save 20% of your income for retirement, for emergencies, and for upcoming planned expenses. Of course, there's also the problem of saving too much money, of hoarding your money. This can be brought on by insecurity. It's tempting for us to rely on money for a sense of safety and security. But ultimately, money will not keep us safe and secure. In the end, your money will fail you. Hoarding can also be brought on by greed, the attitude of always wanting more. Both insecurity and greed have to do with that powerful word, enough. When is enough enough? Enough keeps on changing. It's elusive. When do we make enough? When have we saved enough? When greed comes into play, our earnings, our savings, our wealth, it's never enough. But with God, there is always enough. Enough of what we truly need. Only in God do we find ultimate and eternal safety and security. More on that a little later. A third and final thing we know about the rich young ruler is that he was not a giver. That's the third thing we can do with our money is to give. The rich man knew how to spend and save, but he did not know how to give. When Jesus told him to be generous and to give to the poor, he walked away grieving. His inability to give was a roadblock in his relationship with God. He had put his wealth before God. How do Americans today do with generosity? Quite well, comparatively. The U.S. has ranked as the number one most generous country in the world for the last decade. 58% of Americans today report giving time or money or simply helping others. This is from the World Giving Index based on surveys by Gallup. The next generous countries are Myanmar, New Zealand, Australia, and Ireland, rounding out the top five, all within about two percentage points. The rate of Americans giving money peaked in 2014 when 64% made a financial gift. In 2019, this declined to 58% making a financial gift to any charity. So we lead the world, but we still have only over half of all Americans making charitable contributions. On average, Americans give 2.1% of their disposable income to charity. The Old Testament talks about 10% as a benchmark for giving. HowStuffWorks.com, you know that great resource, talks about giving 3 to 10% as the range that Americans aspire to give. 56% of Americans want to give more but don't feel like they can. Maybe you've heard of the giving pledge. 
This was started in 2010 by Bill and Melinda Gates and Warren Buffett as a commitment by the world's billionaires to dedicate a majority, 51% or more, a majority of their wealth to giving back. So far, they have 207 pledgers. Maybe you've heard of the pledge, giving what we can. This was started the year prior in 2009 in Oxford. Their vision is a world in which giving 10% of our income is the norm. They now have 4,559 members who have pledged to donate 10% of their income over the course of their careers. So far, they have donated more than $126 million to charity. A lot of good can happen by our generosity. It's good for the world, it's good for the poor, and it's good for our own hearts. The rich young man was doing a lot of things right. He was in many ways a righteous man. He was keeping most of the Ten Commandments, in fact. Jesus said to him, you know the commandments. You shall not murder, that's five. You shall not commit adultery, that's six. You shall not steal, that's seven. You shall not bear false witness, that's eight. You shall not defraud, that's sort of nine and ten. Honor your father and mother, that's number four. And what are we missing? Numbers one, two, and three. The first three commandments deal directly with our relationship with God. You shall have no other gods. You shall not take the name of the Lord's vain, name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day for rest and worship. Had Jesus included those three, I wonder if the man could have said, I've kept all these since my youth. My guess is not. The rich man had made an idol out of his money and his wealth. He walked away from Jesus sad because his wealth was so important to him. He couldn't imagine giving his wealth to others or to the poor. It seems he loved his wealth more than God. He found his identity, his security, his satisfaction in money instead of in the Lord. My friends, money is one of the greatest rivals to God in our lives. Money is not evil. Hear me again. Wealth is not evil. But it is one of the most tempting things to idolize. It was in Jesus' day, and it still is today. How is your heart toward money? Do you worry about money? Do you hold on to it too tightly? Do you struggle with greed? How is your relationship with God affected by money? Are you trusting God to provide for all your needs? Jesus knows the only place we truly find our security is in God. The only place we truly find our identity is in God. The only place we truly find our satisfaction is in God. Generosity is the antidote to greed and the path to greater faith and trust in God. Turn to your neighbor and say to them, you are never going to have enough money. You are never going to have enough money. Now say to your neighbor, but God's grace is enough for you. God's grace is enough for you. Enough is one of my favorite words when we talk about God's grace being enough for us. We know that the rich young man in our story was a spender and a saver and not a giver. Whereas he was not generous, Jesus makes clear that our God is generous. Our God is generous to us, generous with love. God's love is enough for you. Jesus looked at the man and loved him just as he was. Jesus loved him so much that he wanted more for him, to know the joy and goodness of loving God. And so Jesus invited him to come closer to God through giving. 
Our God looks at you and loves you just as you are. Our God loves you so much that God wants you to know more of the joy and goodness of loving God. And so Jesus invites you to take your next step, whatever it may be, in coming closer to God. Our God also generously rewards us for our faithfulness in this life. Life won't always be easy. Jesus mentioned persecutions as well. But God will reward us in this life for our commitment and devotion. The disciples had given up everything and Jesus assured them it was worth it. I tell you, the more that I walk in God's ways, the more I am blessed. And I hope you find the same is true for you. And ultimately, our generous God will grant us our inheritance of eternal life, our inheritance of eternal life. The kingdom of heaven is an unearned gift which we receive as little children. We can't buy our way in and we can't behave our way in. In love, Jesus has paid the price through the sacrifice of his holy, precious blood and his innocent suffering and death on the cross. We simply have faith. We trust in the generosity of God and the sufficiency of God's love. As we live our everyday spirituality, we cling to Christ and trust that God's grace is enough for you and for me and for all of God's children. Amen.